Now, some leading scientists are saying it is time to accept that there's no way to stop the spread of COVID and we should give up, end mass testing whilst learning to live with the virus. Now, the latest government figures from the 11th of August show uh, more than 29,000 new cases, as well as 104 deaths within 28 days of a positive test, uh, with almost 6,000 people being admitted to hospital in the last seven days. And today, 89% of adults, that's more than 47 million people, have had one dose of the vaccine and 75% of the population have had their second dose. So that's almost 40 million people who are double jabbed. Now, despite these promising vaccination rates, some experts say it's far too soon to return to total normality. We're joined now by expert in infectious diseases, Professor Paul Hunter, who was at a parliamentary committee earlier this week. He says we need to stop mass testing and learn to live with the virus. We're also joined by Dr Zubaydah Hack, a member of Independent SAGE, who says the pandemic is far from over and COVID restrictions should stay in place. A very good morning to both of you. Let's come to you first, Paul. Um, just, I think this Delta variant that we hear it so much about, has, has that been a game changer, do you think, in how we have to think about COVID? Um, to a certain extent, but not, not really. I mean, I think we've known since uh, uh, the beginning of the year that we were not ever going to really get herd immunity with coronaviruses. Uh, and, you know, you just need to look at the other human coronaviruses to know that herd immunity is, is a myth and has always been a myth. And so... What that means is that essentially everybody who isn't currently immunised and vaccinated will get, uh, will catch the infection. And actually more than that, because immunity to infection doesn't last very long, um, and at the moment we've seen with the, um, the re latest REACT studies that um, probably double vaccination only reduces your chances of getting infected by about 50%, but, it, but vaccination reduces your chances of getting disease substantially greater than that. We're all of us going to have repeated infections with this virus for the rest of our lives. And if you look at uh, the other human coronaviruses or the seasonal coronaviruses that have been with us for decades, typically we get infected about once every four years. And that, what that means is that every year, a quarter of the population gets infected with these uh, viruses, that's about 40 to 45,000 people a day on average. So, but we don't hear anything about them because we've experienced them multiple times in our past and the vast majority of occasions they are asymptomatic or at worst just the common cold. And that's the way that uh, uh, COVID is almost certainly going to be going. OK, so you're, in your view then, we don't, we need to stop mass testing because it's a waste of time and money and disruptive and we don't need to wear masks. Um, but why is the fact that everyone's going to get it uh, at some point in their lives an argument for doing that? Because uh, unlike those other diseases you mentioned, COVID uh, kills healthy people. Uh, it leaves long-term organ damage. It is different, isn't it? And why, if we haven't got to herd immunity, have we got to the point where we sort of almost just accept we're going to get it. Because there will be people yeah. that still get severely affected, won't there? Well, uh, on your first experience of the virus, we do know that if you have a natural COVID infection, you are extremely unlikely to get ill the second time. And presumably, although we can't show this at the moment because there haven't been enough, but by the t when you get it the third time, it will be even less likely to develop symptoms. So... Essentially, this virus is becoming another cause of the common cold. And, and the other thing that, <clears throat> as we are maintaining restrictions, one of the other problems of that is that we're, we're uh, going towards what's, what the Australians call an Im, uh, immunology deficit, in that we are losing immunity to many of the other respiratory viruses that, that operate in many ways very similar to the other human coronaviruses. And... And what that means is that ultimately, because we're increasing the gap between infections with these other viruses, 
when we get them again, we're going to be more ill than we would have been right. otherwise. So we'll end and, up being uh, more sick with the thing. Although, interestingly, you mentioned Australia. They've had one case in Canberra and immediately done a seven-day snap lockdown. So they might be concerned about that, but their reaction to COVID cases is still very, very strong. So, Dr Sabeda Hay... Because they haven't got much immunity. OK, yeah, their vaccination programme is very strong. If Australia opened up now, they would have a, a, a disaster because... They don't have much population immunity. They have very minor, very low levels of immunisation, very low levels of natural immunity, unlike okay. the UK. Right. Well, look, Dr Huck, let's, let's speak to you, if we may. Um, there's an argument Hi. there, isn't there? You know, we are now very significantly vaccinated. We're increasing the numbers of double vaccinations all the time. Um, we're going to have to live with this at some point. Uh, you don't believe so? You don't believe we can? No. no. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and good morning. Um, look, let's let's just revisit some of the stats. You showed, you know, some of the sort of broader stats at the beginning. But let me just put it a little bit into perspective, which is we have approximately 29,000 cases per day at the moment. Just less than a month ago, it was 50,000 cases per day. And we were hurtling towards 100,000, by the way. But 29,000 cases is 29 times more than this time last year. The number of hospitalizations at the moment, the daily hospitalization rates, is 10 times more than this time last year. What's happened at the moment is not the danger that we're in is not the public health danger that we're in. What's happened is our perception of that danger. And this is a very deliberate government strategy because the government strategy at the moment, the only option for the public at the moment is either vaccination or infection. And the reality is as great, and it is fantastic that the majority of the population, the majority of the adult population is vaccinated. So 75% of the adult population are fully vaccinated. But what we need to remember is approximately 30% of the population aren't vaccinated at all. And that includes children. And the one group that we consistently fail to talk about is children. And the one thing that we consistently fail to talk about is long COVID. Now, Paul seems to be very happy with the virus just carrying on and says that we will, you know, it'll be fine. The science has reached us and, and we'll, it'll be like cold. But this isn't like a cold. This virus isn't benign. It's responsible for more than 150,000 deaths. And it's responsible for more than one million people having long COVID, of but which 400,000 people. But, Sorry. Even, but this morning, um, Public Health England are saying that they've tested pupils in 141 primary and secondary schools and found that actually that schools are not that hub of spreading coronavirus. So, in, I mean, so, so, and, and yeah, and also on GCSE results day, you know, we're talking about the effect on children, not just on their health, but those who don't, the educational impact of continually closing down is perhaps, isn't it, far, far greater on a far greater number of children than catching COVID might be. So the it's idea the of continuing down. with the strict, you know, the restrictions and, you know, all those children who have been kept out of mm. school for weeks and weeks on end and they're suffering the consequences of it now and perhaps will do for many years to come. Isn't that also being missed in some of the purely health view of COVID and about the impact on, on our lives? It's not one versus the other, and it's not lockdown, and it's not lockdown that's been responsible for children missing school. It's the complete and utter failure by the education secretary and by Boris Johnson not to protect children in school. There have been very few mitigations in school, and actually, the only mitigation that they really had was was school uh, was face masks in secondary schools. And teachers and being double jabbed, and that other. appears to have worked. It appears to have worked because. How did it work? By the end of July, I'm sorry, Ranveer, but by the end of July, one in 29 children have the virus. Secondary, primary and secondary school children had the highest rate of infection of all age groups. And by the end of July, over one million children were missing school on a weekly basis. Now, that was all to do with the fact that there were absolutely no mitigations in place in school, no ventilation, no school masks, no social distancing. Everything had been abandoned. And basically, children had been left. Children had just been left, uh, you know, abandoned. And we had a child of Independence Age 
This time, last Friday, we had a 13-year-old child on Independent Sage who came on and said that he was despairing about school. He was petrified about going back to school in September because he was clinically vulnerable. He couldn't get the vaccine because he's not clinically extremely vulnerable or with a fam in a family where there's someone clinically extremely vulnerable. But he was clinically vulnerable. He'd missed loads of schools for other reasons. And he was petrified about returning to school in in September because there are no mitigations and there's no option for okay. vaccination. But what some would argue, and I suspect Professor Paul Hunter is, is that he shouldn't be petrified because uh, the, the numbers of youngsters that have been seriously affected by COVID are proportionally very small. But if, and I take all your points, and this is why it's a, it's a fascinating and uh, important debate, but if, if we don't release some of the restrictions and accept an, an element of living with COVID. What is your alternative? So there's restrictions and then, and then there's and then there's public health measures. Now face masks are not huge restrictions. Physical distancing is not a lot to ask for people. And actually, the thing that asks very little of people is ventilation. And that's where this government has wholly and utterly failed because they've done absolutely nothing about ventilation. So the public have been giving this message that, you know, it's fine for you to go to, uh, to, go to nightclubs, take personal responsibility. But then Ventilation isn't a personal responsibility issue. Ventilation is something that well, employers let's... should be doing something about, government should be doing something about, and should be something done okay. about in school. Let's get a final word from, uh, from Professor Paul then. I mean, you were talking to a parliamentary committee. What have you been saying? Well, I think that, that uh, all the witnesses, uh, uh, that, uh, in, which inclu included paediatricians, uh, epidemiologists, uh, and public health specialists were basically saying that we, uh, as a group, we did not consider vaccination of children was um, was necessary and appropriate. We um, the other thing, just listening to some of the statistics, that I don't recognise some of the statistics which my colleague has just said. Uh, children aren't the most at risk. Um, the twenty-year-olds are the people with the most um, uh, in, infections the um, in, yeah. in recent past. And so actually, you know, it, what we've not heard there is how do we get back to a state where we can live in society? And, and essentially, COVID is here forever. Our grandchildren's grandchildren will be catching COVID. Every single person alive today will at some point, whether they've been vaccinated or not, uh, get this infection. And <clears throat> The issue, the delays that we've been able to introduce in society by these restrictions have been very valuable because you know, people are alive now that would not have been alive if they hadn't had their infection delayed till uh, the second wave because of improved treatment or delayed even to the third wave because of the experience of vaccination. Vaccines do not stop the spread of infection, but they do, although they do reduce the, that and they reduce the risk of severe harm. But we are hearing about substantial issues of concern in, in vaccinations, in particularly younger children. A lot of children already are immune. We're vaccinating 17-year-olds at the moment. Uh, the latest ONS figures on antibody prevalence, which date actually to um, the 18th of July, is that about two-thirds, in the 18th of July, two-thirds of 17-year-olds were already immune because of that uh, prior infection. That is probably closer to 90% now. Wow. So, you know, this is a virus that is approaching its ec epidemic equilibrium. And the thing about viruses at their, once they reach their epidemic equilibrium, okay. and we're going to be seeing tens okay. of thousands of cases on average for years to come. Well. Well, I thank but, you to... You know. Yeah, we're, I mean, there's so much information for people watching this mm -hmm. to take in because we all have to then decide how we proceed with our decision-making and how we live. But, thing, though, but we do have to go. I'm so sorry, Professor Zavada. Hey, uh, it's unfortunate. There's so much here to talk about, and I thank you both for giving such really clear information from both of your very opposite points of view, which I think highlights the divide and the decision-making yeah. that we all have to make. Thank you to both of you, Professor Paul Hunter. Uh, and Dr. Zabeda Hack.